simple verses on love one another. The theme of our series is the need for God's love. Over 40 times that great theme of love appears in the epistles of John. The person who makes it all possible was in chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. The life was manifested. We saw him. We handled him. He was real. The problem of what hinders is in chapter 1, verse 5 to 10, and it's sin. The proof that we belong to him is twofold. One, to love others, and two, keep his commandments. The purpose in writing about love in chapter 1, 12 to 17, not only to exhort us in terms of Christian growth and maturity, but also to expose the dangers of worldliness. The presence of the Holy Spirit in chapter 2, verses 18 to 29, what a reminder that we do have an anointing from God, an unction from the Holy One who will teach us all things. We talked about the purity of this love in chapter 3 and verses 1 to 12. And we talked about the practice of this love in chapter 3, verses 13 to 24. Last time in chapter 4, we looked at six verses, the potential of being deceived as he warns us to test the spirits to see whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So now we are at verse 7. From verse 7 down to verse 21, we're looking at the principles of this love of God, and we've divided it into two sections, which it naturally does in the original text. First, in verses 7 to 11, is the reason why we need this love so much in our lives. And I'm going to talk about that in our study now. Secondly, in verses 12 to 21, we'll look at the results that this wonderful love of God will produce in us if it's real in us. So take your Bibles, please, and follow along just five verses on the reason why we need this love so much. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Would you join me, please, in reading that last verse? All of us together, out loud. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Let's pray. Father, we ask in these moments together as we study your word that you will open up our hearts to your love. We know a lot of the loves the world is seeking for. They seem to be searching in all the wrong places and coming up with wrong answers. And the infatuations and all of the emotional responses and sexual overtones of their love is something far short of what you wanted. And I pray, Lord, we'll understand this is your character, your nature, your heart. And may we learn, Father, to let the powerful work of the Holy Spirit in us pour out your love to others. In the wonderful name that is above every name, the name of our blessed Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, the command to love is clear. It's right there in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. We remind you that the words love one another are found 19 times in the New Testament. And the simple words one another, which is one Greek word, many forms of it, alelon, one another, is used 111 times. You get the impression that God sees us as a family. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. We don't act like it often, but that's the way God relates to us. 
10 out of the 19 times that we read love one another are used by the Apostle John, both in his gospel and in these uh, epistles of his, short letters. Peter used it twice, and the Apostle Paul uses it seven times in his writings. The command is clear. I hope nobody walks out of here and wonders what God wants you to do. What is our responsibility to each other? To love one another. There it is. But understanding that is also a very difficult matter. The second thing I draw to your attention is the connection that he makes with our relationship to Jesus Christ. We don't want to make this connection, but God does. At the end of verse 7, he says, for love is of God, out of God. That's where it comes from. This is not human love. This is divine love. And here's the connection. Everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. That's a powerful statement. But if your love is not the one God describes, you might think it's rather superficial. It's not quite what it should be. But if you understand what God's love really is, which we're going to get into in just a moment, you will begin to understand why he made the connection to our relationship to Jesus Christ. You cannot, listen to me, if you cannot, unless you're born again, manifest God's love in your life. You can experience several kinds of love, and the Bible teaches that. But the love we all need the love that brings such deep and abiding satisfaction and warmth to our hearts and our lifestyles and our desires and our ambitions and our dreams. That love comes from the heart of God himself. We do not have it naturally. It's not our natural tendency to love people in this way. The third thing I draw to your attention is the character of God, according to verse 8, is absent when we do not love as he commanded. It's like the other side of what he just said in verse 7. He said, he that loveth not knoweth not God. Why? For God is love. Now be careful about that statement. They use that in false cults to mean that the principle of love is all that God is. God is not merely the principle of love or the force of love or the attribute of love. He is much more. But listen to me, folks. All that he is and all that he does is characterized by his love. That's fundamental. John 3, 16, probably the most familiar verse to our world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 5, 8, God commends or gives his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The character of God is absent when we do not love as he commanded. Number four, the fourth thing I draw to your attention is that the communication of his great love was displayed when his son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, died for our sins, never reduce the love of God down lower than his sacrifice on the cross. Never. Do not come up with your own definition apart from his death on the cross. That's where his love was communicated clearly. And just to help you with that in verse 9 and 10, two of the most wonderful verses, by the way, to memorize in 1 John, I want you to see five things in those two verses. Let's look at them again. Chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Let me give you those five things. One, we have the direction of his love. I almost missed this in preparing the message to teach tonight. I almost missed it. 
It was as though the Spirit of God directed my heart back to a simple thing that was said in verse 9, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. Look at it again. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. The very direction of his love is toward us. It could have been toward angels. He created them for his glory. But they desire to look into the salvation that we experience from his love. He could have just loved material things, which he also designed for his glory. But the Bible says his love was toward us. And it hit me so often we do not see that we are the one recipient of the love that is the true nature of God himself. God is after you. God is directing all that he is and all that he does toward you and toward me. I pray you'll walk out of here and you will never again question any circumstance, any difficulty that happens in your life is to be somehow not related to the love of God. Wrong. Every single thing that happens in the believer's life is designed by God to demonstrate love to you. His love was toward us. Secondly, in addition to the direction of his love, we learn of the design of his love. What's the purpose? And it says that we might live through him. He's not talking about physical life. He's talking about the abundant life that John wrote in John 10.10 10, when he says, I'm come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. The design of his love is that we might have real life, life from God, spiritual life. We might come alive. The lights will go on. We're living at a different level now. Why? Because God loves you and he loves me. The very direction of his love is toward us and the design of his love is that we might live through him. Number three is the description of his love. God sent his only begotten son into the world. Now this is a little tough. In fact, the cults use this to uh, undermine the person and character of our Lord Jesus. Let me help you a little bit with this phrase, only begotten son. The words only begotten are used by John and one time by Paul, just once. That passage by Paul helps us to understand the meaning of only begotten son. Does that mean that he was begotten? No, it does not. The Bible tells us that he's the firstborn of every creation, Colossians 1, 15. The Bible says in Hebrews 1, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. He's something far more than just a son who was begotten. In the Old Testament, the angels are called sons. In the New Testament, believers in Jesus Christ, both Jew and Gentile, are called sons of God. But there is one who is above all, who is called the Son of God. Not a little born one, like he says of us. Not a child of God, no. The word is heir, H-E-I-R, the Greek word huios, an heir. He is the heir of God. Everything God ever made was made for his son. And that shows the Father's love, amen? Everything he ever did, all the galaxies, all the beauty of the mountains and, and the rivers and the trees and the flowers and everything God did, all the angels of glory and all human beings, every last one of them. He said, ask of me, he says to his son, and I'll give you even the heathen for your inheritance. He's the heir of all things, and we are joint heirs with Christ. Don't you know that the love of God is so strong that one day eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. I can only imagine what it's going to be like to be in glory 
and have a brand new body that doesn't ache anymore and will now fit into an airline seat. Amen? God has everything planned for us because he loves us. Preaching about that in Germany, I cannot tell you how many people came up and said, we have not heard that God loved us like that. It's easy to get used to the words, you know. You've heard them a lot. God so loved the world. And the direction of his love is toward us. And the design of his we might really live through him. And the description of that love, God sent his only begotten son. Hebrews eleven seventeen says, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Listen to me. Abraham had other children. He wasn't his only son. What does only begotten mean? It means our English word unique is as close to it. Unique in some sense. Why was Isaac the special son of Abraham? Because it was through Isaac that the Messiah would come. He was blessed above all the other children. And our Lord is exalted above all. And the Bible says God has anointed him above all of his fellows. No one deserves to be in the same sentence with our blessed Lord Jesus. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And just looking at him and what he did for us in God's word tells me that God really loves me. God sent his unique, his one and only, only begotten Son, that I may not perish, but have everlasting life. It's amazing. The fourth thing I draw to your attention about the communication of his love through Christ is the depth of his love. We read very clearly in chapter 4 these words. Verse 10, herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Notice it's past tense. It's referring to a moment of time, and that moment was when he sent his son to die for us. Let me put it to you another way. Our love for God did nothing to move the heart of God toward us. That is the humanism of this generation and culture. Like somehow we could be a blessing to God by loving him and therefore moving him to act in our behalf. Guess again. God is not motivated by our love for him. God makes it possible for us to love him because of what he's already done for us. Our love for God did nothing to move the heart of God toward us. He loved us even though he knew what we were like. And as Romans 5, 8 says, while we were yet sinners, disobedient, condemned, unclean, and corrupt, God loved us with an everlasting love and with loving kindness he drew us unto him. And I just want to say thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. What do you want to say? And number five, the deliverance of his love. Verse 10, he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the mercy seat, the satisfaction of God's wrath, the real deliverance. God's love delivers us from sin, death, and hell. God's love removes his wrath and gives us grace. Back in 1 John 2, 2, he said of Jesus, He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And I say thank you, Lord. What a wonderful Savior we have. As I reviewed all of this, I kept asking myself one question. What does it mean to love one another? I know it's rooted in the cross. 
And greater love hath no man than this, and a man lays down his life for his friends. But it says, love one another. I kept thinking about it. It was driving me into almost confusion. It seemed like every time I thought of it, it just challenged me. So I knew there was only one thing to do. I took the words one another and went through 111 usages and said, God, speak to my heart. That's what I did. Let me review what we've said. The command to love is very clear, very simple, very powerful. The connection with our relationship to Jesus Christ is powerful. Only those who are born of God and know God can possibly love in this way. And the character of God, number three, is absent. When you don't love as he commanded, it says, he that loveth not knoweth not God. Why? For God is love. And that's a pretty powerful and clear statement. And then four, the communication of his great love was displayed when his son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, died for our sins. And that leaves us with one verse. And I kept reading it over and over again. Let's look at it again, verse 11. Beloved, he's writing to believers, not unbelievers. Christian friends, Jew and Gentile together. Beloved, if God so loved us, how do you do that? By sending his son. If he so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Number five is the commitment to love others is based on how God loved us. And that began to unlock some things for me. I'm gonna make sure when you leave the study tonight that you have a copy of it in your Bible from now on. But I'm gonna tell you now what I learned. Just again, asking God, Lord, help me to know what it is to love your people, the family that I'm a part of by faith in Jesus Christ. And here's what I came up with. Number one, it involves recognizing our true relationship to each other. What a simple point. But the Bible says we are members one of another. It says it in Romans 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 3. The Bible tells us to have the same mind to one another. And yet we're all on different tracks. And we don't even like some of the people that we call brothers and sisters in Christ. Something's wrong. Romans 12, 16. Romans 15, 5. Have the same mind. You are members one of another. Stop acting like you can isolate yourself in this clique and that group and you name it. If we are brothers and sisters in the family of God, then loving each other involves recognizing our true, genuine relationship to each other. We are members one of another. I may not like it, but I'm stuck with you. Number two. I saw in going over these one another passages that it involves receiving into our fellowship all who are genuine believers in the Lord, regardless of whether they have the same likes and dislikes. Ouch. I have found, I don't know about you, that I really like people who like me. Amen? Somebody comes up and says, I just love you. Well, immediately I see their wisdom, and I want to love them. Why, God bless you. I like sports. And I meet a man who likes sports. I know he's a spirit-filled believer. I know right away. And the fact of the matter is, we all have different opinions and likes and dislikes about colors, about circumstances and problems in life, about family, about so many things. And yet the simple truth of Romans 15, 7 stands in stark contrast to what I see in the body of Christ. It says, receive one another as he has received you. 
Well, aren't you glad the Lord accepted you? You're not such a great prize, amen? And if he can take a turkey like you, maybe he can get us to take each other and get along a little better, huh? To receive and accept somebody, even though they're different than you are, all because of one truth. They're born of the Spirit of God. It's my brother and sister. We're in the family of God together. Amen? Amen. And when you go across countries and cultures and languages, you cannot help but see the power of this truth. And number three, in looking at one another, I saw that to really love involves responding with a measure of love and affection to other believers. Well, he says it over and over again in Romans 16, 1 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians 13, 1 Peter 5. You know what he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Amen? I'm not really that prone to kiss men. Amen? Hey, women, maybe you understand this. But when you go to the Middle East, you better pucker up. You're going to have to do a lot of kissing, and it might smell a little bit, and it might slobber a little bit, but you're going to demonstrate that you care about somebody. He said a holy kiss. We're not talking about sensuality here getting in a few little sexual things on the sly because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Wrong, it is holy, the Bible says. Ken Taylor, when he did the living Bible for his children, was so shaken by the words holy kiss, he translated it in the living Bible, greet one another with a holy handshake. And I kind of kidded him once, and I said, uh, exactly what is an unholy handshake? Maybe when you squeeze her hand too hard, I don't know, but it was interesting. Don't you understand that a lot of people, they greet who they want to greet? <laughs> oh, come on, people. That isn't the love of God. That isn't the love of God. You have your special friends that you greet. Is that what God said? No, it is not what he said. Is that what we do? Oh, yeah, we do it all the time. And can we ever justify it? Why, that person isn't like me. And by the way, they've done some things I'm not pleased with. And all of a sudden, the affection that should dominate the body of Christ is affected by our own stubbornness, selfishness, pride, arrogance, you name it. We become very selective. I remember a dear fellow who was one of the ugliest guys I ever met in my life. He's now home to be with the Lord, but he used to come by to church and want to pray. And uh, he had a lot of problems physically. And he couldn't control his arms and his legs or his speech. One day, it took him so long. It took him 30 minutes to say what normal people would say in five minutes. So I'd sit there and pray that the Lord would give me patience. And I knew all along that this man needed God's love. And one day he spit it out. He said, why don't people give me a hug on Sundays? I remember crying that day. I walked over and hugged that shriveled up body of his and watched him cry. I, I suggest to you all that we better be careful I see in the body of Christ selectivity. I see us responding to some and not to others. And we're not doing what God said. And we're showing that our human loves are controlling us and not the love of our blessed Savior. Number four, the fourth thing I saw about one another is that it involves refusing to hurt or harm any other believer by bad actions, words, or attitudes. And what I ran into was a series of don'ts. This wonderful one love one another relationship, we're to love each other. I saw all these don'ts, all these negatives. As a matter of fact, I found 10 of them. Let me just mention them. 
I'll give you all this later. One, don't judge others. <laughs> it's like we're defeated on point one. Point one, don't judge any other believer. And about motives. You don't know the motives of anybody's heart, and you don't know your own. And God said in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, not to judge anything until the Lord come, who then will bring to light all the hidden things of the heart. Stop judging each other. And I see people doing it all the time. It's like a game. Romans 14, James 4, very clear. Stop it. There's only one judge. You're not that judge. We have no right to do this. Number two, don't be arrogant toward others. Puffed up, walking around like you're more important than somebody else. 1 Corinthians 4, 6. The fact of the matter is you say you love somebody, but you think you're more important than they are? Or they don't quite have the abilities or talents that you really need in order to have fellowship? Be very careful. Number three, don't go to law against them either. 1 Corinthians 6, 7. Looks like we have to apply that one a little bit more today as we've gone crazy about lawsuits. Number four, don't lie to them. Literally in the Greek, it's stop lying. It assumes it's our natural tendency to put on a front and not let people know who we really are. Now, first of all, there's some things about each of us that we shouldn't be telling folks. Amen? Hopefully it's buried under the blood of Christ, confessed and repented of, so don't bring out the dirty wash and remember the sins against anybody anymore. Stop doing that. And don't take into account a wrong suffered. All those things need to be looked at. But lying, purposely deceiving brothers and sisters in Christ? And number five, don't stay away from them. <laughs> I don't know about you, but there's some folks who call themselves Christians I want to stay miles away from. But God says in Hebrews 10, 25, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, but instead encourage one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. And number six, don't ever speak evil of them. James 4, 11, don't do it. They're a brother in Christ, don't speak evil evil of them. You may have to confront them about something they said that's wrong or that they wrote that is incorrect. I understand that. But the fact is, God said don't ever speak evil. We sometimes do that to point out how bad their view is because after all, you know, they're not really who they said they were. Be very careful. Number seven, don't hold grudges against anybody. Has somebody done you wrong and you can't let it go? God says stop that. They're brothers and sisters in a family. Number eight, don't hate them. Titus 3, 3 and all of 1 John. Stop hating them. And number nine, don't show any partiality either. Why, we do that all the time. We have our special little few that we enjoy. Don't show partiality. And number 10, don't provoke them. How do you provoke them? Galatians 5, 15 to 26. By envy and jealousy and strife. Constantly doing it, needling people, maybe to make yourself look good or them to look worse than what they are. I say to you, if you really love one another, it refuses to hurt or harm other believers by bad words, thoughts, actions, or attitudes. Now number five in our list of things about loving one another, it also involves restoring them when they mess up. Folks, I'm not sure that we really love each other in this regard. Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says, Ye who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. That is the law of love. It involves restoring others. You don't leave them in their mess. You help them get out of their mess. And that is bearing one another's burdens. And that's not easy to do. And number six, it involves reacting with humility and kindness and forgiveness. The Bible makes it clear to forbear one another, forgive one another. 
Be humble. Be subject to one another. If you humble yourself, God will lift you up, reacting with humility and kindness and forgiveness. And finally, I saw that loving one another involves reminding others to trust the Lord and his promises in difficult times. I looked at all the verses related to this. We're to edify one another. That's to build up, not tear down. We're to admonish one another. Sometimes that's a warning, but we admonish with the word of God. We're to care for one another. When somebody's hurting about something, we hurt too. We are to comfort or encourage one another. We are to pray for one another. All of these things in the context of reminding others to trust the Lord and his promises when they're going through hard and difficult times. All of this, love one another because he loved you. Let's pray. Father, you know us better than we have ever known ourselves. Our hearts are deceitful. Lord, you have told us to love each other. You've said many things that convict us. Our self-centered attitudes, our exclusiveness, our isolationism, our doing our own thing and not really caring about what others think or feel or believe should be done. Our attitudes are arrogant and proud. And God, I pray by your mighty Holy Spirit that you would deal with us, for judgment must begin at the house of God. We need to get right with you. And where you bring to our attention something we have done wrong, give us, Lord, that courage from your spirit to acknowledge it and confess it to you. And where we have hurt people by our actions and our words, give us the strength and wisdom and courage to go to them and seek their forgiveness for what we have done. Father, I pray that we would remember again that the world will really believe us when they see that we love one another. Lord, I don't know what's going on here, but I know that we must be born again or we can never love in this way. And maybe all of our frustrated attempts to love others is rooted in the lack of the Spirit of God within. So I pray, Lord, that if there be in this meeting folks who are not sure of their relationship to you, are not confident they've been born again, God, I pray by your Holy Spirit, you would draw them to confess faith in Jesus alone, who died for our sins and rose again from the dead. Help us to commit our life and future to the only one who can save us. And Lord, I pray right now that every believer here would examine himself and herself as to whether we're really in the faith, whether we're really loving the way you want, and give us the courage to say that we're sorry, that we'd have the courage to confess where we have done wrong. Speak to us, Lord. We need your mighty power and presence to come upon us in a special and fresh way Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.